The Struggle for American Independence, Episode 15, Liberty or Death. Hello everyone and welcome back. In the last episode we discussed Massachusetts being put on the pathway to independence after Thomas Gage attempted to seize military supplies and powder at a store in Concord. After that, it inspired the Battle of Concord between the Massachusetts militia and the British regulars, setting a course for the Siege of Boston and open violence between the Patriot and British forces for the first time. Today, we'll talk a little bit about an overlapping series of events that transpired in Virginia at about the same time. Because remember, although Boston itself gets a lot of notoriety and coverage in this whole conflict, there were independence movements throughout the colonies, and Virginia was certainly no exception, as we'll find out today. So we need to cover the events that transpired, particularly in 1775 in Virginia. So as we discussed in the last few episodes, the Intolerable Acts were passed by Parliament and began to be enforced by Thomas Gage. And that caused uh, some open violence eventually in Massachusetts and certainly a lot of protests. Radicals at Virginia were actually very highly sympathetic to Massachusetts. This group included people like Richard Henry Lee, George Mason, and Patrick Henry, who certainly believed uh, that Bostonians were being treated terribly by the British and that the policies were not only unfair but contrary to the British constitutional system that they respected. So Virginia decided to convene a second Virginia convention and it was composed of delegates that had been selected in the first Virginia convention kind of as a response to the Intolerable Acts. What should Virginia do about these things? Because Virginia in so many ways was the most powerful and important colony. It had deeply entrenched institutions, um, militia forces that drilled regularly, a very powerful connection to the Anglican Church, and a very uh, rich aristocracy, as we've talked about before. So the delegates in the Second Virginia Convention decided to discuss what course should be adopted by Virginia when it came to British policy in North America. And attendees of the Second Virginia Convention included, among other people, George Washington, Edmund Randolph, Thomas Jefferson, Patrick Henry, Peyton Randolph, and St. George Tucker. So there were very prominent Virginians at this convention. On March 23rd of the convention, which remember, this is before the outbreak of Lexington and Concord in Boston, um, Patrick Henry introduced a series of resolutions that he proposed that Virginians should adopt. And remember, we discussed Henry before because he had infamously introduced resolutions that would essentially void, nullify, and adhere to a policy of non-compliance when it came to the Stamp Act in 1765, but now he was introducing resolutions to respond to British policy that had transpired thereafter. And by this point, Henry was certainly a fixture within Virginia. He was considered one of the chief radicals in the state. He certainly had a Whig disposition and was certainly um, inclined to believe that the British policy was never going to be kind of repealed at this point. The policies that had abnegated the Constitution, as he saw it, were egregious, and they should be they should be voided, um, thrown aside, cast aside, resisted, etc. So he introduced a series of three resolutions. The first one is that a militia composed of Virginians was the only security of a free people from the danger of a standing army. That's what this resolution said. Because that's what he saw the British regulars as being, a standing army in times of peace. Remember, this was a violation of the British constitutional system, and then that's spelled out explicitly in the 1689 British Bill of Rights. The second resolution he introduced said that a militia was necessary for the protection and defense of Virginia and to, quote, secure our inestimable rights and liberties from those further violations with which they are threatened. 
So again, he's reiterating the purpose and the pivotal importance of a militia. The third resolution, perhaps the most incendiary, resolved that Virginia, quote, be immediately put on a posture of defense and to, quote, prepare a plan for embodying, arming, and disciplining such a number of men as may be sufficient for that purpose. So this resolution essentially said that war was coming. It actually said war had already arrived, and Virginia needed to adhere to a wartime footing. That meant militia forces needed to be structured under a command structure. They needed to muster regularly and drill. They needed to partake in training exercises which would allow them to forcibly resist a military power. So they're making no mistake about what's coming here. And Henry infamously defended this series of resolutions in a rousing oratory in St. John's Church on March 23rd, the same day that he had proposed the resolutions. And this is perhaps one of the most famous events in the whole struggle for American independence. That's the day where Henry delivered probably the most, um, one of the most influential American speeches in history. It's still quoted to this day over and over verbatim. Um, but there's some interesting things about that speech um, we'll cover in a bit. But Henry's general line of reasoning in this speech relayed a few certain principles that he was trying to lay out. Number one, patriotism is a defense of principles, not a government. So according to Henry, there is a superlative uh, essence above that of a government that should be defended in adhering to patriotism. So a government could not violate the force that is, a, is above it, a philosophical line of you know, traditions that should not be violated. Another of the key points that Henry made was, decisions are best made by observing the antecedents of the past. Henry in this speech said, I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided, and that is the lamp of experience. I know not, it, I know not what is to come in the future, but by the past. So Henry was essentially saying that we need to observe the lessons of history to prove um, the posture that we need to adopt here. Henry also said that British occupational forces were, quote, the implements of war and subjugation. So again, according to Henry, War, war footing was already being uh, implemented in terms of the British policy, so there was no other recourse for Virginians but to meet that policy with their own posture. Another thing Henry drove down in this speech was that liberty is more important than money. Uh, he had basically shunned the notion that sunshine patriots should win the day, and what he meant by that was... Well, it's easy to object to policy when it's personally beneficial, um, but it's not easy to object to governmental policy when it could really affect your own personal well-being. And certainly that was the case here because by adhering to some of the boycotts and non-importation agreements, which we'll talk about later, people were really endangering their own economic well-being, but they were doing so because they believed that liberty was paramount above the governmental policy. Another thing Henry said was to suspect everyone who approaches the jewel of public liberty. He said that the that public liberty is the most important uh, thing in a society. It's the thing that allows us to uh, be individually free from coercive forces, to own property, to protect ourselves and our own well-being and also living the kind of life that produces happiness. Another thing Henry said was that the war between Britain and the colonies had already begun. This was a really incendiary thing to say because really the outbreak of Lexington and Concord didn't come till later. So there wasn't, you know, actual military skirmishes or battles that had come yet, but Henry knew what was coming. He believed that this was unmistakable. Britain had taken a wartime posture and that it's useless to try to protest the fact that war was here. It couldn't be allayed. It couldn't be thrown aside. You know, George III was not going to concede to the grievances that had been sent his way. And a lot of what we know now of the liberty or death speech comes from 
basically the recollected um, the recollections of St. George Tucker, who was one of the delegates that was present there after Henry's essentially first biographer had kind of gone back through his life and solicited uh, people that had information about what Henry did and what Henry said. And we can't know for sure that all the words that we have today were sp spoken verbatim by Henry, although I think it's plausible that some of them were. Um, and we have some evidence for that. For instance, after Henry said, give me liberty or give me death, that kind of slogan appeared on some militia company's shirts that they wore. So some of this is can, could be considered hyperbole, but there is evidence to indicate that Henry said some of these are at least expressed some of this train of reasoning. But nonetheless, we have to take the exact words with a grain of salt, but uh, the speech, no matter how you construe it or what notes you believe are accurate or not, the speech was a pivotal moment. And here's one of the things that Henry said in that speech, quote, I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided, and that is the lamp of experience. I know of no way of judging the future but by the past, and judging by the past, I wish to know what there has been in the conduct of the British ministry for the last ten years to justify those hopes with which gentlemen have been pleased to solace themselves in the house. So Henry's saying, look back at the past. The British ministry has adopted a wartime footing. This aggression cannot stand. We cannot tamefully accept it. We have to fight it head on. Another thing he said was, quote, It is in vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war has actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring in our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. So that is probably the most famous part of the speech which came at toward its conclusion and henry's speech was taken in an almost fantastic way um, according to edmund randolph there were several minutes of silence that followed the speech and he wrote no other member was yet adventurous enough to interfere with that voice which had so recently subdued and captivated so these questions of whether to involve Virginia and Virginia's militia forces were very controversial. Um, there were some hardliner conservatives that did not want to do anything that would provoke the wrath of a British response to Virginia, much like what had happened to Boston. However, again, there were notable radicals in Virginia at that time. And there's evidence to suggest that Henry's speech did in fact captivate some people and persuade some people to join in his course of logic, in his line of reasoning, which was the radical response to this. And Henry's three resolutions were in fact carried by a margin of 65 to 60. So those three resolutions he introduced were carried. This is a pretty slim margin. So there were conservatives in Virginia. However, at this point, many people believed that the only way to meet the British policy was a head-on military uh, footing. So many in the audience considered this an epic moment in history, likened to Lexington and Concord for Boston. Some people viewed this for the rest of their lives as one of the most important things to have ever happened. For instance, one military officer, Edward Carrington, decided that this was so important that he wanted to be buried at the place where he had heard the speech. And he was actually... He got his wish in 1810 after he died, but he had actually witnessed Henry's rousing speech from outside the window of St. John's Church. And if you visit it today, you can see where Carrington is buried, right there next to that window. The Virginian, uh, Virginia Gazette, which was the most highly influential newspaper at the time, announced that, quote, the sword is now drawn. So compare this again to what John Adams said 
in Massachusetts after Concord. He said the die is now cast. So people realize there's no going back. After this set of resolutions is adopted, there's no mistaking Virginia's policy. There's no mistaking the fact that Virginia is going to meet uh, Britain head on with its own military forces, much like Boston and Massachusetts had done. Perhaps most important of all, the speech had an effect on Virginia's colonial governor. His name was Lord Dunmore. Technically, his name was John Murray, Lord Dunmore being his title of nobility. He was extremely concerned about this radical sentiment. He thought it threatened uh, the British uh, management of the colony. It threatened um, the stability that the colonial government had offered. And he thought, you know, these radicals are getting carried away here, much like Gage thought in Massachusetts. So a few other reactions to Henry's speech that day. One of them was from Thomas Marshall, who was the father of John Marshall, a famous Supreme Court justice. Thomas Marshall had said, quote, Henry's speech was one of the most bold, vehement, and animated pieces of eloquence that had ever been delivered. George Mason, also famous in the state, wrote, quote, Every word he says not only engages but commands the attention, and your passions are no longer your own when he addresses them. So Henry just had a masterful gift of oratory, and everyone knew it. He was likened by some to an American Cicero, remember the famous Roman Republican that had, you know, disputed the philosophy of Julius Caesar and Caesar's ascension to power. He was really likened to those classic heroes of Republic's past. So the Virginia Convention passed Henry's um, resolutions, and it also assigned a committee to raise and organize the militia forces to support Massachusetts and to defend Virginia itself. Henry was named chairman of this committee to organize the Virginia Colonial Militia. Um, also on this committee were George Washington, Edmund Pendleton, Thomas Jefferson, Richard Henry Lee, and several others, but those were some of the most noteworthy. And all of them were generally considered more radical, more Whig voices when it came to a forcible resistance to British policy. Also, the Virginia Association was created. This was a boycott association, and it had three basic factors, three basic facets. The first was immediate non-importation of British goods, and particularly tea because that was the, the most controversial um, because of the Tea Act of 1773. Another of the facets was that Virginia would agree to an absolute boycott of all direct or indirect British goods with the only exemption of medicine. So this even included slaves. Virginia was not going to buy British goods whatsoever. Also, the third and probably the most effectual and um, meaningful one was an absolute non-exportation of goods to Britain beginning on August 10th. So not only was Britain was not only was Virginia not going to accept British goods in trade, it wasn't going to ship any goods to Britain. Remember, this is what threatened people's personal economic livelihood. Merchants, many merchants hated this thing. It was going to affect people's continual consumption and their their livelihoods in their workplace. They were not able to make as much money in many circles because of this, but truly the people and the representatives of the people believed that liberty was more important. Also, Virginia selected delegates to the Second Continental Congress, which was to take place. So, shortly thereafter, there was an incident that unfolded in Virginia that was somewhat similar to what had happened in Massachusetts when it came to the powder alarm. Remember there, Gage and a small group of British forces successfully removed the gunpowder and military supplies from a munitions store that had been kind of arranged by the provincial Massachusetts government. 
Like Gage in Massachusetts, Dunmore was also concerned about the accumulation of wartime materials like powder, supplies, and other materials that would be used by a militia to resist an army. And remember, Virginia had at this time began raising and training militia forces, thanks in part to that committee that was formed by the Second Virginia Convention. Lord Dunmore targeted a Williamsburg powder magazine for seizure. And a company of British soldiers, actually sailors, were ordered to remove that gunpowder that was there. The act of the seizure of the gunpowder was actually discovered by a group of townsfolk in Williamsburg while it was taking place. So while this uh, store was being raided, the gunpowder seized, an angry group of townsfolk gathered and sounded an alarm that provoked the militia. So militia was starting to gather now. Because this had happened, militia forces sprung to action much like ha happened after the powder alarm and especially happened before the Battle of Concord, a mob surrounded Dunmore's residence, the colonial governor. He's being threatened in his own home. And the mob demanded the return of the powder. They considered it an affront to property. They said that this powder was the property of the Massachusetts provincial government. I'm sorry, the Virginia provincial government, not the property of the British. This was a violation of our property rights. You can't disarm us and you can't seize our property simply because you think that it's a risk to you. So this inspired what is now called the March on Williamsburg. What happened there was patriots around Virginia throughout many of the colonies with a few exceptions started to converge on Williamsburg. Patriots refused to accept a royal payment in return for the seizure of the gunpowder as well because Dunmore had said, well, hey, I mean, yeah, I seized your gunpowder. You want it back. I get that. If it's a violation of your property rights, I'll see. I'll uh, repay you for the gunpowder and at a pretty fair rate. Well, this was unacceptable. Several companies of militia then decided to march on Williamsburg. However... Some of the colonies in the last moment decide not to after especially George Washington had urged against it. Because, again, even at this time, there were people that believed in resistance to the British, but this, they thought, might be going a little bit overboard. It might really provoke a wrathful response of aggression on the part of uh, Britain to really, you know, hurt the patriot interests. It would be counterintuitive, thought George Washington. However, Washington was not able to sway everyone, and certain militia forces, including that of Hanover County, do in fact match on the, the colonial capital of Williamsburg. This Hanover County militia were commanded by none other than Patrick Henry. So Patrick Henry, in command of this militia, does in fact march on Williamsburg. Henry actually stands down at the very end. Although many historians, including Murray Rothbard, said that in his book, Conceived in Liberty, that Henry likely had the forces necessary to overthrow Dunmore at this time. But again, did not believe that, that it was yet time to take that drastic of a step. Instead, Henry stopped. He refused royal payment for the return of the Williamsburg gunpowder, and he was escorted by security forces to northward to take his seat at the Continental Congress. Wherever he went through Virginia en route, he was cheered. He was at this point considered a Virginian hero. He was among the most famous people of his time and probably the most important person in the state at the time. Also what transpired was Lord Dunmore felt threatened at this time and he eventually escaped Virginia after continued unrest had threatened his government. He was in a panic. He really thought that the colonial government would be overthrown by these militia forces. Now, as we'll learn later, Dunmore does try to come back later. He does come back later, try to kind of maintain control over the colony. But from this point forward, he's not successful. So Dunmore, although he tries to rein in all the radicals um, and kind of leave... Virginia in a stable colonial state, he never is able to do so after this. One of the things Dunmore does prior to that, though, 
pr um, I shouldn't say prior. One of the things Dunmore does after this series of events was he makes good on a threat to order an emancipation of Patriot slaves. So in response to this radical agitation that had tr been transpiring through Virginia, Dunmore had threatened months prior that if you don't c control yourselves and stop taking an aggressive posture against your colonial government with force and with militia, I'm going to order a, an emancipation of slaves, but only of patriots. So what this would do was it would promise freedom to any fugitive slaves that escaped from their masters in Virginia and fought on the side of the British, underneath Lord Dunmore himself. So this greatly raised apprehensions and anxieties in Virginia because many of the landed aristocracy there thought it would really create a large-scale slave rebellion that would threaten the entire patriot movement in the colony. They thought that this would undermine everything that they had worked for because it would really threaten the lives, fortunes, and properties of those that owned the slaves, which were the most closely politically connected people in Virginia in general. However, one thing to note about Dunmore's proclamation was that it didn't apply to fugitive slaves belonging to Tories. So basically, it wouldn't apply to those that remained loyal to the British government and on the side of Dunmore in his attempts to stabilize Virginia in the midst of this crisis. And really, in the end, in many ways, the proclamation was symbolic. Most slaves couldn't read were not able to see the proclamation, were not read the proclamation. Many of the slave owners had kind of shielded their slaves to make it, make it so that they would never be aware of this type of thing. And many were able to escape even if they had wanted in Virginia. So really, what really raised the, the trepidations of slave owners only caused about 1,500 slaves to escape Virginia, which... I mean, it seems like a pretty big number, but in the grand scheme of things, it was not. And really on top of that, it was only about 300 slaves that ultimately even survived because there was a large smallpox outbreak that really had caused massive disease, massive uh, devastation among Lord Dunmore's ranks. And only about 300 ever were able to fight on the side of Dunmore and then escape back to Britain. Dunmore also imposed at this time martial law upon Virginia. And martial law is simply a course of control of the military power over the civil functions of government. So that's what he allowed to do in Virginia. He said, this thing's gone too far. We're going to have military and military tribunals conduct the civil affairs of government in the, in the colony. So part of Lord Dunmore's proclamation read as follows. Quote, I have thought fit to issue this my proclamation, hereby declaring that until the aforesaid good purposes can be obtained, I do in virtue of the power and authority to me given by his majesty, determine to execute martial law and cause the same to be executed throughout this colony. And to that peace and good order, May the sooner be restored, I do require every person capable of bearing arms to resort to his majesty's standard or be looked upon as traitors to his majesty's crown and government and thereby become liable to the penalty the law inflicts upon such offenses such as forfeiture of life, confiscation of lands, etc. That was part of Dunmore's proclamation. So what he's saying, much like what had happened in Massachusetts was hey, throw down your arms, do not rise up and join with these patriots forming counter-colonial militias threatening the colonial government. If you do, you will be looked upon and treated as a traitor. That's what Dunmore said, because he truly believed that these people were traitors against their own government. But really, they had kind of formed their own government and were attempting to conserve the traditional series of liberties that they had been promised by their colonial charters. And that's how they looked at it. Um, another thing that Dunmore said, and this is in terms of the uh, general emancipation, was, quote, And I do hereby further declare all indentured servants, Negroes or others, free 
And again, actually, again, it said appertaining to rebels, making it known that di this didn't apply to Tory slaves. Free that are able and willing to bear arms, they joining his majesty's troops as soon as may be for the more speedily reducing this colony to a proper sense of their duty to his majesty's crown and dignity. So he's ordering the slaves of patriot rebels to run away from their masters, join with Dunmore and the colonial, um, the, the militia that he was raising to try to put a boot down on these patriot ruffians. Well, instead of adhering to that, there was additional unrest and the radicals reacted in kind. The Continental Congress, which had been formed at this point, the Second Continental Congress, urged Virginia to resist, quote, to the uttermost. And they didn't need to be told that because there were sensibilities in the colony that would have done so regardless. And that's how they postured themselves. The Virginia General Assembly then passed an act to nullify Dunmore's proclamation. Their act said that, first of all, all slaves that were conspiring to rebel from their masters and join the British were to be executed without the benefit of the clergy. Now, benefit of the clergy, for all intents and purposes at this time, was a legal maxim that allowed convicted offenders to receive a lesser punishment than what would be traditionally um, assigned to a particular behavior. The other thing that the uh, Virginia General, As General Assembly Act said was that slaves that returned to their masters within 10 days would be fully pardoned, that they wouldn't be punished by the General Assembly, and they would not be viewed as offenders against the law. So again, Dunmore passes the Emancipation, the General Assembly passes an anti-emancipation, but it gives leniency to the escaped slaves that would return. At this point, Lord Dunmore condemned and ridiculed um, patriots, but he himself was condemned and ridiculed and basically at this point lost all effective political power. He tried to regain it a few times and like I said earlier, the losses of smallpox devastated not only many of the fugitive slaves that did escape inside with him, but also his own military forces that were in Virginia. And really the only battle of noteworthy importance that happened around this time, the Battle of Great Bridge, there was a decisive loss on the part of Dunmore and his British forces. The colonial Virginia militia had triumphed over Dunmore, and he eventually will have to escape Virginia forever. Here is what Virginia's General Assembly put into their act that nullified Dunmore's proclamation. Quote, By an act of the General Assembly now in force in this colony, it is enacted that all Negro or other slaves conspiring to rebel or make insurrection shall suffer death and be excluded all benefit of clergy. We think it proper to declare that all slaves who have been or shall be seduced by his lordship's proclamation or other arts to desert their master's service and take up arms against the inhabitants of this colony shall be liable to such punishment as shall hereafter be directed by the general convention. So important thing to note here is that Virginia has crossed the point of no return, much like Massachusetts had. And although there are some overlapping events that spill over past the formation of the Second Continental Congress, we should know that Virginia has adopted a radical foothold. The colonial governor, Dunmore, has been kicked out, never to return. So a few of the readings that were kind of associated with the material presented in this lesson were, firstly, Patrick Henry's Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death. It's a speech. You can find this just by Googling it if you wish. But that information is compiled from the recollections of St. George Tucker, who had been in attendance during the famous speech on March 23rd, 1775. The best resource in general about this series of events is Kevin Gutzman's Virginia's American Revolution. He describes all of the political elements involved in all of these circumstances and really does a great job of framing this time in Virginia. That book is 
is incredible. Murray Rothbard's Conceived in Liberty also discusses some of this content. And my own Compact of the Republic, The League of States and the Constitution in Chapter 2 does as well. I'll include the link to that in the show notes. And if you pick that up, I really appreciate it. You can see it right here behind me. And um, in the next lesson, we will go back to the Second Continental Congress, that group of ambassadors from all the colonies that had mulled and decided to convene to confront the challenges before them and to stare back the British and say enough was enough.